The holiday of St. Valentine's Day has a premise of love and affection that inspires billions to exchange terms of endearment during mid-February. But where and when did this holiday begin? Is it supported by the kind of love that is taught in the Bible? Why the traditional question found on so many cards asking, will you be my Valentine? To find out, stay tuned. Greetings from Quest for Truth, a program about the world today and its future. Because of the holiday of St. Valentine's Day, a virtual love frenzy seems to take place during the month of February. But when, where, and how did this holiday come into existence? Why the imagery of Amoretti, Cupid that is, and the exchange of Valentine cards? And is this holiday truly connected to the noble behavior of a Catholic saint? Surprisingly, the history of Valentine's Day goes back much further than Catholicism. It actually dates back to the very origin of paganism itself. Why Valentine's Day traditions can be traced to a man by the name of Nimrod who was the founder of Babylon. As Moses recorded in the book of Genesis, Cush begot Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Eternal, and therefore it is said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Eternal, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. Nimrod was known as being a mighty man, which is a term that can also mean a tyrant. And interestingly, the name Valentine comes from the Latin word valens, meaning strong, vigorous, and powerful. And these are terms synonymous with the description of Nimrod, who became the subject of innumerable legends. Along with his mother Semiramis, Nimrod was eventually worshipped as a god for thousands of years after his death. And traces of his worship are still found in many religious practices today, including Christmas, Buddhism, Easter, Hinduism, and Valentine's Day. Ray Stedman stated the following in the article God's Funnel. Nimrod evidently gained a reputation as such a hunter, but he was more than a hunter of wild animals. The Jewish Talmud helps us here, for it says that he was a hunter of the souls of men, and therefore introduced a perverted, degraded form of religion into the world. It began at Babylon, spread to Nineveh, and can be traced in history as it subsequently spread throughout the whole of the earth. Nimrod was at the heart of Babylon's religious rites. In the Babylonian tongue, the word for heart is Baal. Baal, the pagan god mentioned frequently in the Bible, is really another title for the founder of false religion, Nimrod. According to Lemprier's Classical Dictionary, Baal was also known as Pan, who was associated with a pagan religious holiday called the Lupercalia. And some other gods that arose and were associated with this holiday were Lupercus, Februus, and Faunus. This holiday was celebrated during the late winter, corresponding to our mid-February. Lupercus was a Greek and Roman god of shepherds, and it was called upon to protect the sheep. This god was known as a mighty hunter, a mighty wolf hunter, a title very similar to the description of Nimrod found in the book of Genesis. And there is also evidence that Nimrod traveled to the areas of Rome's inception to hunt, as the Italian Apennine Mountains were at one time known as the Mountains of Nimrod. 
The Lupercalia was celebrated in anticipation of spring and was considered a religious rite to promote purification and the fertility of land, animals, and people. The ceremonies were directed by the Luperci, meaning brothers of the wolf, who were priests of Faunus. The famous general and politician Mark Antony was once a member of this priesthood. The ceremonies began with Vestal Virgins bringing prepared foods to their gods. Two naked young men then sacrificed a dog and one or two goats. Goats were used because they were symbolic of sexual vigor, and Lupercus was also considered a god of shepherds, and thus a dog was used because these animals were considered to be the flock's main defender against wolves. The blood from the animals was then smeared on the foreheads of the young men and wiped off with wool or goat's hair dipped in milk. A sacrificial feast followed, and the youths after this girded themselves with loincloths made from the goat's skin. The goat's skin was also used to fashion whips called the Februa. The young men proceeded to gallivant around the boundaries of the city, striking men and women with the Februa who would line up along the way. And this act was believed to provide fertility, easy childbirth, and protection from curses to anyone the Februa touched. It is believed that some women would remove their garments in hopes of obtaining better results. A famous Latin poet who lived during the turn of the first century mentioned this event in one of his poems. Neither potent herbs, nor prayers, nor magic spells shall make of thee a mother. Submit with patience to the blows dealt by a fruitful hand. Speaking of the young men wielding the febra. This fertility festival was accompanied by rowdiness, horseplay, and depravity. And this becomes obvious when we consider the half-naked youths frolicking around, slapping men, women, boys, and young girls to encourage fertility. Another false god associated with Nimrod and the Lupercalia was Pan. Portrayed as a brawny individual, Pan was partly human with several features of a goat. He has been depicted in ancient art as running through the mountains, seducing young men and women, and sometimes copulating with goats. Because of his Nimrod-like strength, it was believed that Pan brought great fear upon many of those in his presence. The expression panic was derived from this ancient myth. The Book of Religion in Greece and Rome documents the association of the Lupercalia and Pan when the two male youths girded their naked bodies with loincloths made from goatskins. This is done by the young men transforming themselves, for the time being, into human he-goats, the very embodiment of sexual vigor and at the same time of pugnacity. It is not by accident that the ancients supposed the performance to take place in honor of a god who might be identified with the Greek Pan, for he too is a he-goat, partly humanized. Another god honored during the Lupercalia was Faunus, and the description given him provides further insight into the supposed purification of the holiday. The Encyclopedia Britannica described Faunus as, an ancient Italian rural deity whose attributes in Roman times were identified with those of the Greek god Pan. A grandson of Saturn, Faunus was typically represented as a half-man, half-goat. Like Pan, Faunus was associated with merriment, and his twice-yearly festivals were marked by revelry and abandon. At the Lupercalia, a festival held partly in his honor each February in Rome, well into the Christian era, Youths clothed as goats ran through the streets wielding strips of goatskin. A few other pagan gods of old were Februus and Juno Februata. These were known as gods and goddesses of Febris, a term meaning fever that's related to passion. The widely used expression being lovesick probably came from this term. Because of the many gods and goddesses and the similarities and festivities during this month, Deities worshipped at the time were often confused with one another, and sometimes they were thought of as the same. We can now see that the title of the month of February gives insight into the origins of Valentine's Day. The term February comes from the Latin februa, meaning feast of purification. It is the last month of the ancient Roman calendar so named in reference to the feast held on the Ides of the month. As winter began to come to an end and the days slowly become longer, this is when the pagan festivals of fertility, renewal, and spiritual enlightenment began. And another reason for choosing this date stems from the instinct of many birds to pick a mate at this time of year. 
Because of the phenomenon, it was considered an ideal occasion for people to become lovers. By one of the most popular English metaphysical poets of the 17th century wrote this about birds, lovers, and Valentine's Day. Notice his use of religious terms reflecting the mixture of theologies. Hail, Bishop Valentine, whose day this is. All the air is thy diocese, and all the chirping birds, choristers, and other birds are thy parishioners. Thou marriest every year, the lyric lark and the grave whispering dove, the sparrow that neglects his life for love, the household bird with the red stomacher. Celebrations thou makest as the blackbird speed as soon as doth the goldfinch and halcyon. This day more cheerfully than ever shine, this day which might inflame thyself, old Valentine. A trail through time emerges, showing us how the pagan fertility festivals transitioned into a variety of traditions, and one of these ancient traditions connected to the Lupercalia was surnamed the Lover's Lottery. Celebrated by the youth on the eve of the Lupercalia, names of young girls were written down and placed in urns or jars. A teenage boy would then draw a name and the two would be paired, forming a temporary liaison for dancing, merrymaking, and erotic games at feasts and parties throughout Rome. James Hastings wrote about this activity in the Encyclopedia of Religion and Ethics, Volume 3. The customs of Valentine's Day have been handed down from the Roman festival of the Lupercalia, celebrated in the month of February, when the names of young women were put into a box and drawn out by men as chance directed. This is the origin of Valentine's cards, linking men and women together for sexual purposes. This festival was characterized in the later Roman period by wanton raillery and unkindled freedom. This custom was observed in the Roman Empire for centuries. During the medieval days, the names of maidens and bachelors were put into separate boxes and drawn out in pairs. The male often wore his Valentine's name on his sleeve, and to wear your heart on your sleeve means that it's easy for other people to know how you are feeling, but this is an adage that was derived from the tradition observed during the medieval lover's lottery. John Brand documented the tradition stating this. On the eve of the 14th of February, St. Valentine's Day, a time when all living nature inclines to couple, the young folks in England and Scotland too, by a very ancient custom, celebrate a little festival that tends to the same end. An equal number of maids and bachelors get together, each writes their true or some feigned name upon separate billets, which they roll up and draw by way of lots the maids taking the men's billets and the men the maids, so that each of the young men lights upon a girl that he calls his valentine, and each of the girls upon a young man which she calls hers. By this means each has two valentines, but the man sticks faster to the valentine that has fallen to him than the valentine to whom he has fallen. Fortune having thus divided the company into so many couples, the valentines give balls and treats to their mistresses, wear billets for several days upon their bosoms or sleeves, and this little sport often ends in love. Because of the immoral behavior that took place during the lover's lottery, the Catholic Church tried to change the activity into something more acceptable by substituting the names of girls with the names of saints. Young people would draw a name out of an urn or box and attempt to emulate the saint whose name they had drawn throughout the following year. Alban Butler wrote the following in his book, Lives of the Saints. To abolish the heathen lewd superstitious customs of boys drawing the names of girls in honor of their goddess Februata Juno on the 15th of February, several zealous pastors substituted names of saints in billets given on that day. St. Francis de Sales severely forbade the custom of Valentines or giving boys in the writing of names of girls to be admired and attended on by them, and to abolish it he changed it into giving billets with the names of certain saints for them to honor and imitate in a particular manner. By the 14th century this practice had died out and people reverted back to their old ways. In the 16th century, the church once again tried to make Valentine's Day saintly, but it was just as unsuccessful as their first attempt. During the 17th century, celebrants began to exchange love notes, which became known as Valentine cards. But despite their artistic value, 
giving a card to another person asking, will you be my valentine, or you are my valentine, is no less than an extension of the lover's lottery, a practice that often resulted in premarital sexual activity. And this is only the beginning of understanding the truth about Valentine's Day. There is much more for you to know, including how this holiday is entirely opposed to the values of the Bible. And for this reason, Quest for Truth is offering a free booklet. We produce a variety of literature to help people understand the Bible and how God expects people to live in preparation for the future. Today we are featuring the booklet titled, The Truth About Valentine's Day. All of our books and booklets are offered free as a service in the public interest with no undesired follow-up. You may visit our website to read or request this booklet, or stay tuned and at the end of this program we will show you how to receive a free copy of The Truth About Valentine's Day. Another symbol of love related to Valentine's Day is the mischievous, winged, childlike archer known as Cupid. Some people know him as an amoretti or have stolen a term from the Bible calling him a cherub. According to Roman mythology, Cupid is the son of Venus, a goddess of love and beauty. He was known as Eros in ancient Greece and said to be a god of sexual desire. It is from his name that we have the word erotic. Most representations of Cupid portray him as a winged baby, but ancient talismans actually portray him as a winged phallus. He has been described in ancient folklore as an extremely handsome, famous archer who frequently hunted in the mountains. Thus, another representation of Nimrod, said to be a mighty hunter, emerges. Cupid's mythological relationship with his mother is also similar to that of Nimrod and his mother. Several paintings from the Renaissance era by Bronzino and Michelangelo depict an incestuous relationship between Cupid and Venus. Today the portrayal of Cupid is tame and considered cute and harmless, but using this kind of imagery to portray love of any kind does not mix with the teachings of the Bible. Likely the most common symbol of Valentine's Day is a shape known as the heart. And although this shape bears no resemblance to a human heart, Everyone considers it to be an expression of love, passion, or desire. But where did this shape come from? Some suggest that the shape resembles shapely features of a woman, such as her breasts or the buttocks. And while these suggestions might seem risque, when it comes to the truth about Valentine's Day, they certainly have much more in common with this shape than a human heart. The Catholic Church asserts that the symbol for the heart began in 1673, when Margaret Mary claimed to have a vision of this shape inside of a crown. Her dreams supposedly were the inspiration for a Catholic devotion called the Sacred Heart of Jesus. However, archaeological artifacts document this shape back to an earlier time from an ancient city in modern-day Libya known as Cyrene. Cyrenica coins have been preserved depicting a unique and valuable plant only found in this area. It was a rare species of giant fennel called silphium that was used to produce the most valued and expensive pharmaceuticals of the ancient world. Silphium was Cyrene's chief local export through much of its early history, making the city the wealthiest in the region. And one of the distinct characteristics of this plant was its fruit and seed pod called phylon that grew in the same shape of today's symbol for the heart. Silphium was highly valued for several reasons, but its chief use was as a powerful contraceptive. The explanation for its infamy was a means to prevent pregnancy. Some of the teas and potions made from silphium were said to be the most effective forms of birth control at the time. Soranus was antiquity's foremost gynecologist, and he wrote, To some people it seems advisable once during the month to drink Cyrenaic balm, that is silphium, to the amount of a chickpea in two sias of water for the purpose of inducing menstruation. These things not only prevent conception, but also destroy any already existing. Apparently this ancient physician believed silphium to have both preventative and abortive properties. Pliny the Elder also wrote that the plant promoted menstrual discharge and therefore worked as an abortifacient. This ancient historian also stated that silphium was worth more than its weight in denarii. 
Could its use as a way to manipulate the results of sexual behavior be the motivation to use the silphium seed pod to represent a symbol of love? There are several references to this once rare and now extinct fennel in historic poetry. One narrative written over 2,000 years ago by Catalyst indicates that an adulterous relationship would go undetected as long as they had silphium. And so the value of this plant became so great that the people of Cyrene harvested it to extinction by the first century AD. Therefore, modern science will never know just how effective it was as a contraceptive. Nonetheless, today both children and adults freely use this same symbol not knowing where it came from or what it truly means. Silphium is the likely candidate for its origin because of its connection to avoiding pregnancy while having intercourse. A final point for us to consider in this program is the Christianization of Valentine's Day. Formerly known as Saint Valentine's Day, the Lupercalia was eventually dressed in Christian apparel, but the history of the holiday is a far cry from any of the behaviors of the saints mentioned in the Bible. Instead, the customs of the Lupercalia were adopted and altered in an attempt to convert masses of pagans. This process began during the 3rd and 4th centuries when Christianity became a state-sponsored religion in the Roman Empire. Vast numbers of pagans began to stream into the church, but the deep-seated passions of the masses was a battle the ministry did not want to fight. In an attempt to build bridges, the church decided to give pagan festivals a makeover. The Saturnalia became Christmas. Samhain became Halloween. The Feast of Ishtar retained the name Easter, and the Lupercalia became St. Valentine's Day. In Clavis Calandria, Volume 1, John Brand stated, For almost every pagan ceremony, some Christian rite was introduced. And historian Lavinia Dobler wrote, As far back as 496, Pope Galatius changed Lupercalia on February 15th to St. Valentine's Day on February 14th. A supposed saint named Valentine was chosen as the patron saint of lovers. And they also created a new feast called the Purification of Virgin Mary, which was later called Candlemas. Despite denial by the Catholic Church, there are many documents showing a connection between St. Valentine's Day, Candlemas, and the Lupercalia. Why Pope Innocent XII stated the following in a sermon that he gave in the 16th century. Why do we in this feast carry candles? because the Gentiles dedicated the month of February to the infernal gods, because the Holy Fathers could not extirpate the custom, they ordained that Christians should carry about candles in honor of the Blessed Virgin. It becomes clear that pagan customs were retained as whitewashed Christian observances. But why did the church pick Valentine? Did a patron saint of lovers even exist? Historians agree that there is no tangible evidence that such a man actually lived, even though the Catholic Church recognizes three Valentines in the Martyrologies under the date of February 14th, the facts about all three of these men are highly questionable. Why their stories are better described as legend, and it's now believed that they were simply fabricated, enabling the papacy to retain the appeal of the pagan February feast by changing its licentious meaning to a more acceptable image of love. Instead of being related to an honorable saint, the evidence indicates that Valentine's Day is directly related to a number of heathen customs and the Lupercalia why it's a result of a misguided attempt to convert masses of unbelievers. Still, many will say that, even though this celebration came from sinister sources, it stands for something different today, and it isn't a bad thing. Therefore, how could it be wrong to observe something that was once evil, but now appears to us as being good? Why the Apostle Paul addressed such a question when he wrote, for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. 
the papacy has long appeared to many as ministers of righteousness. But the pageantry is part of the deception that has deceived much of the world. And Christ said, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. The Messiah was not speaking of people who had come claiming that they were Christ. He was telling his followers to beware, because many would come and profess that Jesus was the Messiah, but they would use their claim as a means to deceive others into accepting damnable heresies. They would mix evil with good, and they would preach a gospel message about Christ being the Savior, but not the true gospel that Jesus preached, which is a need to keep all of the commandments. And this is the, precisely what has occurred. False teachers have convinced billions that Sunday replaces the Sabbath. They have altered God's commandments to accept traditions of men. And the Apostle Peter spoke of this happening during his time, stating this, But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies and many will follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. Those who profess to believe the Bible should question where their loyalty lies when observing holidays such as Valentine's Day. Is our loyalty with the values of the Bible or with those who pervert the gospel? Sooner or later, we will all have to make a choice. And the prophet Elijah made this point clear, stating, how long will you falter between two opinions? If the Eternal is God, follow Him. But if Baal, follow Him. Ladies and gentlemen, we cannot be indifferent or on the fence about what we observe and do. And we cannot mix the ways of God with the ways of the Lupercalia. When we are presented with the truth, we have to choose to do what's right. And to help you make that decision, we have produced a free booklet. Quest for Truth has written a variety of literature to help people understand the Bible and how God expects faithful people to live in preparation for the future. All of our books and booklets are offered free as a service in the public interest with no undesired follow-up. Today we are featuring the booklet titled, The Truth About Valentine's Day. This booklet is the most comprehensive publication on the subject to date. It discusses everything mentioned in this program and much, much more. You may visit our website to read or request this literature, or stay tuned, and in just a few moments, we will show you how to receive a free copy of The Truth About Valentine's Day. Until next time, this is Terry Moore, encouraging all of you to continue your quest for truth. If you would like the literature offered on this program, please contact Quest for Truth, P.O. Box 80248, Billings, Montana, zip code 59108. You may also call us at 1-800-723-6108 or email us at witness at eternalcog.org.